Welcome to Lesson 5b, Types of Plumes. The first thing we're going to do is watch a slide presentation from my Visible Emissions training course. This is part of the PSU Continuing Education Program, and it's about different types of plumes. I call it meteorology. It's kind of a first course in meteorology. There's also a PDF file with thumbnails of the slides. After that, we'll talk about some of the things I want you to know from that slideshow. So let's do the show, and then I'll do the summary after that. So here's a quick PowerPoint presentation about meteorology. We'll look at wind speed, how it varies with elevation and during the day, and we'll look at a Buford scale, and we'll talk about wind and plumes near buildings. We're all familiar with the boundary layer. The wind increases with elevation. So here's wind speed in miles per hour versus height above the ground. And so we have a nice boundary layer. And there's also various differences between day and night cycle. If you don't know how fast the wind is blowing, you can always use this Buford scale, which is based on things like leaves and small twigs in constant motion, flags, whether they're unfurled or flapped, and you can get a rough idea of the wind speed in various units here. So I want to talk about the effect of wind on plumes near buildings. So here we have wind from left to right with our boundary layer. And here's a schematic of a rectangular building. The wind creates a vortex in the front, a big one on top, and then a real big one in the back, a wake vortex. And depending on where the stack is in relation to the building, you can get some fumigating going on. So you may say that this is just a sketch. True, but here's an actual picture that we found that looks very similar. Wind blowing from left to right, kind of a rectangular boxy building with some smokestacks and there's a big wake vortex and this gets fumigated down here. So if you lived here or parked your car here, you would not be a happy camper. So if the stack is taller, that would help. It might move this uh, out of the way. If the stack were in a different position, it would help also. And also if the stack were made hotter, that would help. So that leads me to buoyancy of plumes and lapse rate, atmospheric stability, and how it varies between the day and night. That's called, fancy name is diurnal. In terms of buoyancy, a hot plume rises rapidly out of the way. That's good. But a hot plume also wastes a lot of energy. That's bad. A cool plume does not waste a lot of energy. That's good. But a cool plume does not rise. And it may even fall, which is called downwash. So that's bad. Here's an example. You have a very cool plume and it actually can fall down and then fumigate people down here. Hot plumes rise rapidly but waste energy. Cool plumes save energy but don't rise well. So as in most engineering situations, you have to compromise between energy savings and plume buoyancy. Taller stacks always help. So here's a nice picture of two stacks, a short one here and a tall one. And the tall one has the smoke going up and out of the way. The short one is fumigating people down here. So obviously a taller stack is better. And this indicates there's a temperature inversion, which we'll talk about in a minute. So we define lapse rate as the negative of the temperature gradient, negative dt dz. The standard or normal or average lapse rate is always in purple on these slides, and it's about six and a half degrees C per kilometer. And this is negative, so temperature drops by six and a half degrees for every kilometer. In English units, that's almost 20 degrees F for every mile of elevation. So if you go up a 5,000 foot mountain in the summertime, it'll be almost 20 degrees F cooler up there, which is why people like to go to the mountains in the summertime. Dry adiabatic lapse rate corresponds to a neutrally stable, I'll color that green, atmosphere, and that turns out to be about 9.8 degrees C per kilometer or 28 degrees F per mile. In other words, mixing is neither promoted nor inhibited when it's neutrally stable. The stability of the atmosphere can be determined by comparing the actual lapse rate to the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So we have three cases, actual lapse rate greater than dry adiabatic, that's unstable or red, and mixing is enhanced or super adiabatic. Actual lapse rate equal to dry adiabatic lapse rate, that one's neutral and green. And if the actual lapse rate is less than the dry adiabatic lapse rate, it's stable or blue, and we call that subadiabatic. Mixing is inhibited. So here's a plot of all these kinds of lapse rates. The neutral one, the dry adiabatic one, is the green dashed one here. So that's the 9.8 degrees C per kilometer. Notice the temperature is decreasing as you go up. This is elevation and this is temperature. A super adiabatic case is unstable, high temperature at the bottom, low temperature at the top as you go up. So the warm air wants to rise, the cold air wants to go down, fall. So you get some big eddies and lots of mixing going on. 
The normal standard one is in purple here. That's a little bit less than the dry adiabatic one, but the temperature is still decreasing as you go up. Anything to the left of the green line is super adiabatic or unstable. Anything to the right of the green line is subadiabatic or stable. And so this blue line here, even though the temperature is decreasing as you go up, is still stable. And if you go further to the right, there's an extreme case here that the temperature inversion, where the temperature is actually going opposite. Instead of decreasing as you go up, it's increasing as you go up. Cooler temperature here, hotter temperature here. So the warm air is above the cool air, and it wants to stay that way. That's very stable. And that leads to problems, namely the temperature inversion. I like to think of it as a lid. And even for hot plumes that come up, they may go above that temperature inversion briefly, but then kind of settle down. This one never actually made it, these two plumes, but they basically spread horizontally. And you typically see this on cold winter mornings. I took this picture myself on a cold, foggy morning, parked near my house, obviously a cold day with the snow. The ground was very cold and the air was still warming up early in the morning. And this was smoke and fog from people people's wood burners and some fog there. And you can see clearly that's a nice flat lid where that smoke and fog is trapped in a thin layer. It doesn't want to mix. And so these can lead to lots of air pollution problems because of this trapping. So all the smog from industry and cars and all this stuff going on, people making air pollution gets trapped, especially in mountainous regions where you have mountains trapping it from moving horizontally. So it just kind of stays there pollution gets trapped. Here's another picture of trapped air pollution. And this slide just shows that when you have normal conditions with the temperature decreasing as you go up, the smoke can just rise. Even if there's no wind, the smoke's just rising very nicely. However, in this case, an elevated temperature inversion, which causes a kind of a lid that traps that smoke there, and that's where you lead to problems like this. Just a quick comment about diurnal temperature variations. During the early morning is when you have these temperature inversions, typically late in the afternoon. Like here, you have an unstable situation, and so you're likely to see the temperature inversions early in the morning. You never see this kind of a picture late in the afternoon. You see this early in the morning when the ground is cool, but the air is warming up. Let's look at various types of plumes. I'm going to describe six different types of plumes. In each of these slides, there's a boundary layer from left to right. That's the wind. And then we plot temperature as a function of elevation. The color depends on whether it's unstable or red as here. Purple is the kind of normal average, and then green is neutral, and blue will be stable. So this is called a looping plume when you have super adiabatic conditions, very unstable, and so you get lots of mixing. We call that a looping plume. If you have nearly adiabatic conditions, we call that a coning plume because the smoke spreads out kind of the same in all directions, vertically and horizontally, so this plume looks like a cone. If you have a ground-based temperature inversion, so temperature is rising as you go up, cool on the ground, higher temperature as you go up, here's that lid. If you have a short enough stack, the plume gets stuck in between the ground and this lid and it doesn't want to mix in here because it's very stable. So we call that a fanning plume because it fans out. Here's another picture of that, like a 3D picture. It spreads rapidly, uh, easily in the horizontal direction, but not in the vertical direction. The next one is called a lofting plume. Same situation with the temperature inversion, but a taller stack. This particular one is tall enough that the bottom is within the temperature inversion, so that's kind of flat at the bottom, but the upper half of the plume is in this very unstable region, highly super adiabatic red here, unstable, so it lofts up. So we call that a lofting plume. If you have an elevated temperature inversion like here, so here's unstable, stable, unstable like that, and your stack happens to be such that it crosses into the temperature inversion, the top in this case will be flat because there's not much mixing going on in here, but the bottom will be very unstable and so it fumigates to the ground. This is the worst case. We don't want this because it fumigates people on the ground. And then finally, there's something called a trapping plume where you have a temperature inversion and then an unstable region, and then another temperature inversion, an elevated one, and then unstable again. And if your stack happens to be right between 
these two temperature inversions within the unstable region. It will mix a lot in here, but it can't really penetrate that lid and it can't really penetrate this lid, so it's kind of trapped here. When I teach this live or in a continuing ed course, I, I give the students a quiz called Name That Plume. So I'm going to show photographs and you have to tell me whether it's lofting, trapping, looping, coning, fumigating, or fanning. So this one should be obvious. That's a looping plume. It's very unstable. You can see all the mixing going on. Now this one, there's a steam plume and we're looking into the sun, both of which are no-nos. But we're not worried about the steam. Let's look at these two plumes because they're different. This one from this stack, which is a little bit taller stack, is showing lots of mixing. So that one would be a looping plume. But this one is spreading out more kind of evenly in all directions. So I'd probably call that one a coning plume. Here's one where we have a plume that's fairly flat on the top, but it's going down to the ground and fumigating people down here. It looks like it's probably a very cool plume, not warm enough. It could have benefited from higher temperature, which would have brought it above that. There's an elevated temperature inversion here, and so it is a fumigating plume. Here's a more recent one from a couple years ago where there was a Texas chemical tank fire that you may have seen in the news, and lots of thick black black smoke. And again, it's kind of flat on top, but it's also flat on the bottom. So we call this a trapping particle plume. Notice that some particles are actually falling down. You can think this might be fumigating, but these are just the big particles that fall down to the ground. So it makes that appearance. But this is most likely a trapping plume. And then this one has two stacks, a short stack and a tall stack. And there has to be a temperature inversion in between because these two plumes don't even mix. And so the bottom one, you can see it's fumigating to the ground and the top one is pretty flat. So I would call the top one a fanning plume and the bottom one a fumigating plume. This is a picture I took with Penn State's old coal burning plant. The power plant used to be coal, now it's natural gas. And you can see that the plume comes out. There was a particle plume, there's some steam, and then there's particles here. And the particles just spread out in this real thin line and I could see it for miles and the picture doesn't do it justice but with my eyes I could see that this was very thin and it went for miles and miles so that's all obviously a fanning particle plume. Here's a summary, some major points from the presentation. First of all, plume behavior depends greatly on stack height, plume temperature, wind, and location near buildings. Temperature inversions are extremely stable. I think of it as a lid and you get this kind of trapped smog and air pollution. There's six basic types of plumes that depend on the local conditions of the atmosphere, how it varies with elevation, which is called lapse rate. So know how to recognize these plumes from photos. And then also we know how to recognize these plumes based on the local atmospheric conditions where the plume is. So let me give you a few summary kind of examples about that. I want you to know how to figure out which plume there is based on the temperature distribution. So let me do an example here. Consider a ground-based temperature inversion. I draw the temperature as a function of z here, and, and I'm not color coding according to our different variations. But one thing I wanted to mention is that this dashed purple line, the normal standard one, is still stable even though the temperature is decreasing with elevation. So a temperature inversion is the extreme case where the temperature is actually increasing with elevation as we've said before. But even when it's slightly at a negative slope here, it can still be stable. It's not until you get below the dry adiabatic case to the left of that that it's unstable. So where is this unstable? Well, it's not exactly at the top of this temperature inversion. It's a little bit above that because we're into this region where it's a little bit to the right of the dry adiabatic lapse rate, but still stable. So that's a minor point, but we can say that everything above some line here is unstable and everything below that inside the temperature inversion and a little bit above of it is stable. So depending on how tall the plumes are, you can have various kinds of plumes. So if this is a short stack that's within the stable region, and there could be a little bit of buoyancy, but then we would have a fanning plume. So it would just spread out horizontally, but not vertically because it's in that stable region. If we happen to have a stack that's about a little bit higher than the temperature inversion like this, what would you expect? Well, it's unstable above that. So we'd expect there to be a lot of turbulence and mixing up there, but it'll penetrate this lid here, so it makes it pretty flat in here. So that would then be a lofting plume. Of course, if you had a stack that was really high, say way up here, then it would be a looping plume because it would spread in all directions.
degrees, something like that, until, of course, the bottom of this reached the top of that temperature inversion, but that would be a long distance away. Let's do another example. In this case, we have an elevated temperature inversion. So here's the temperature inversion, and then we can draw our kind of lids, everything above some location here, a little bit above where this turns around is unstable. It's stable within the temperature inversion, and then at some place below that temperature inversion, it's unstable everywhere in between there and the ground. And again, depending on the stack height, you may have, in this case, if it's a very small stack height, it'll start mixing because it's unstable, but it'll reach this kind of lid and then it'll fumigate to the ground. So that would be a fumigating plume. If you have a stack that's a little bit bigger than that, somewhere in this stable region, then it can't mix any place so that you'd have a fanning. And then if you happen to have one that's somewhere near the top of this thing, it will try to spread to the bottom, but it can't, but it'll be able to spread up. So then you'd have a lofting plume. I want you to be able to figure out if I give you a lofting plume or a fanning plume or whatever I give you, you should be able to determine what kind of temperature condition there is, or if I give you the temperature conditions and the stack height, which type of plume you get for that condition. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.